This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Calm. Seize the day and sleep the night with the help of Calm, the number one app for sleep. This Week in Startups listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash twist. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash twist. And 8sleep, the first bed engineered to improve your sleep through dynamic cooling and heating, detailed sleep tracking, and more. Try the pod for free for 100 days at 8sleep.com slash twist. Apply for the next Launch Accelerator cohort. Applications are due December 23rd. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And we've been talking a lot about the Pegasus movement. What is the Pegasus movement? Well, I wrote an article uh, at calacanis.com, my blog. And uh, in that article, um, I explained how some of our startups, we didn't anticipate this, were skipping rounds of funding. How do you skip a round of funding as a startup, right? Don't you have to raise a seed round, friends and family, then a seed, then a series A or a bridge in between those, a pre-seed, a post-seed, a pre-series A, a series A, a, a bridge, a series B? Well, it turns out that if you build a great product and people love it and you're frugal on your team and you don't waste money, you might be able to have this crazy new innovation. It's called Profits that you can then pour into growth. And if you skip a round of funding, lo and behold, your cap table might go from the founders or co-founders owning five to 15% at a sale to 15 to 30 or 40% at a sale. And boy, uh, does that make all the difference in the world. And we've been finding these Pegasus founders uh, over time. And today we have on the program, uh, Alex McCaw, Welcome. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of Clearbit, clearbit.com. That's C-L-E-A-R-B-I-T.com. And uh, we actually use Clearbit at uh, inside.com to, um, I guess, give us better data on our readers. Mm -hmm. Explain to people what Clearbit is and when and why you started it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so Clearbit is essentially a data provider. We... Uh, collect facts on every company in the world and we sell those facts and people use it to understand their customer base better. Got it. Uh, that's at a very basic level. These days we have a lot of different products but at its core that's what we do. And we st started the company about five years ago at this point. Okay. Contact enrichment I think is the product we use mm -hmm. at Inside. It's worked out pretty well for us. We can basically when somebody signs up for uh, a newsletter, when you sign up for Inside AI, you will ping your database and say, hey, this person's at whatever company, amazon.com, or mm -hmm. maybe you just have their Gmail. You're able to ping, and correct me if I'm wrong, different services on the web and learn about that person or company, all public information. So it's nothing the person hasn't put out them themselves, from what I understand. So you could, if I put in Jason at Calacanis, you might know that's my email and this is my LinkedIn page, my Twitter mm -hmm. page, my Facebook page, mm -hmm. and be able to then get a second level of public data on me that I could then put into my database easily as the CEO of Inside.com, correct? Correct. So when it comes to people, we're basically just automating a, a Google search that right. someone could do manually. Uh, when it comes to companies, there's a bit more proprietary data in there. Got it. Um, how has life changed since the Cambri it was Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. scandal? Mm -hmm. I would suspect that there's more focus on people who collect data. Mm -hmm. You collect data on individuals. How many people do you have in your database now? Um, Hundreds of millions? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been fed. You don't know how many people you have in the database? No, I don't. <laughs> Actually, that's something you should know as CEO. <laughs> yeah, maybe It's got to be over 100 million, right? Yeah. It's got to be yeah. a billion? No. So no, no, somewhere no. between 100 million it, and a billion. We, we're fairly uh, sheltered from this because we're B2B data only. Right. You know, we're not selling consumer information. We're not selling someone's marital status, like how much they earn. We're, we're B2B data only. So, What does that mean to a consumer who's listening and might be concerned about their data? What well, do you carry? What don't you carry? It's just publicly available data that something like your um, role in seniority. Got it. Like that, that's the kind of data that we reveal on the person level. And then on the company level, it could be 
uh, company size, location, company vertical, uh, that kind of thing. And, and that information is freely available on the company's website or LinkedIn or AngelList, Crunchbase, other places like that. Yeah. And where we, where we get into more proprietary stuff is that we actually let you look up companies by IP address. Ah. Yeah. Why is that important? IP address obviously is your internet protocol. Mm -hmm. Is that what it says for internet protocol? Address. So yep. that would be your long string of numbers right. that identifies uh, your web browser hitting a server somewhere. Well, every company has visitors coming to their website. A lot of these visitors aren't logged in. Up to now, they just couldn't know who, which of these companies were visiting. Mm -hmm. It was just unknown. So with our API, we have a, a, a product called Reveal. You can actually now see the list of companies that are visiting your website. Got it. Now, Google Analytics would track the IP addresses of people coming, but mm -hmm. they didn't do that step of resolving who owned that IP address. Correct. You take that extra step. Correct. That is also publicly available information? It's Some of it is. Most of it is not. Ah, so how did you build that database then? So we have free tools that we we, we distribute, um, like Clib Connect, for example, with the Chrome extension that we have, which is a couple of hundred thousand people using it. Clip It Connect. Clip It Connect. Clear Bit Connect. Yeah. What does that do, that free extension? So that's, um, do you guys remember Reportive back in the day? I was the first investor in Reportive. Right, there you go. It's yeah. a Reportive clone. I kind clone. of remember it. It's a Reportive clone. Got um, it. Yeah. So that allows people, when somebody emails them, to go do a reverse lookup and tell you about the person. Yes. And so if you use that tool, you upload your... Uh, it's a very your... clear give-to-get model. So when yeah. you install the thing, we're very upfront. Yeah. And we say, if you want access to this, you get access. You have to give access to your contacts. Um, so you upload your address book from Gmail. Yeah. And then you get to use it. Yes. To... You, you can also find any corporate email address by it as well. Ah. So if I want to find, if I type in somebody's name, Jason Calacanis, and they work at the launch... Yes. investment company, you will try to resolve that email address. Correct. And so you're building up this database of proprietary stuff mm -hmm. that allows you with Clearbit to know who came to your website. So that's cool that you know, okay, Microsoft, 20, people, 20 different IP addresses that Microsoft contacted mm -hmm. my website. But do I know that person's email address? No. So it's just at the company level, and you're absolutely correct. It's less useful for a company the size of Microsoft. Um, you might be a little bit more useful if you know the city and the the um, ah. department level, but we um, but we don't get down to the person level. Got it. It's it's much more useful for smaller companies. It's um, Got it. if you if you see some SMB um, looking at your website, let's just say you're a VC, right? And you put this on their website. Now you can see all the startups looking at your website. Got it. So I would know Clearbit looked at my website. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're looking or evaluating us to invest in them. Mm -hmm. How does one use that data without being creepy AF? AF is, uh, I, mm -hmm. I, you seem like a young gentleman here. You're, you're 26, 27? How old are you? I'm 29. You're 29. Yeah. yeah young whip, whippersnapper <laughs> over here. Uh, AF means, uh, <laughs> yes. You know what this means? <laughs> yeah, yeah. As frequently as possible. That's yeah, what I was right. told by my I millennial see. producer. <laughs> no. Um, but this could be creepy AF, could it not? Yeah. So you connected me. If I called you mm -hmm. and I say, hey, Alex. I mm -hmm. noticed you were surfing my webpage today. Do you want me to invest money in Clearbit? Yeah. You might be a little freaked out. Well, so how do you advise people who are using Clearbit to not be creepy AF? Well, it's only at the company level, right? So okay. at the so start, it's less creepy. Yeah, you can't. You don't know who at the company's mm -hmm. visiting, um, but you can use this information to do some really interesting things that are great for the people visiting your website. So okay. to give you an example. Uh, let's just say I am uh, working at a healthcare company and I'm visiting your website. Okay. Now you can display healthcare testimonials. You can display testimonials specific to the industry vertical that I'm in. Got it. So I do a reverse lookup, or I use Clearbit, to dynamically tell me you're mm -hmm. from a company that has 100 to 250 employees. Mm -hmm. So I know that you're a medium-sized business. Mm -hmm. So the testimonials on the website are dynamically served Four, learn how Acme Healthcare works with companies uh, with under 500 employees. Right. 
to manage whatever. But if you came from a company with over 5,000, you'd say, learn about our enterprise solution for managing thousands of employees' health care. Yep. That's right. And we've actually And that had, would all be done dynamically. It's all dynamic, dynamically. And we've actually had a company called Frame.io, and they removed the pricing for the enterprise visitors. Hmm. And they added half a million dollars in ARR just by doing that. Okay. Hold on a second. Let's unpack that. They added a half million dollars in annual run rate, uh, reoccurring revenue. Yeah. By when an enterprise customer defined as what? Uh, I think ballpark. Over, yeah. Over like five hundred employees. So if a company with five hundred employees comes, we don't show the individual pricing. We just show the enterprise pricing. We we just show contact sales. Contact sales. Yeah. And then if it's for anybody else, it might say sign up for a five person account. Precisely. Very yeah. interesting. So you're able to dynamically. A cater to your customer. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. When we get back from this quick break, I want to understand how you deal with uh, privacy uh, and letting people know what data you have about them. So, mm -hmm. as an individual, do I get to know what you have on me mm -hmm. at clearbit.com and mm -hmm. then change that one way or another when we get back on this week in startups? Do you want to turn your amazing idea into a website? This way you could do things like blog or publish content, sell products, maybe even sell services, promote your physical or online business, and announce events or special projects. Well, Squarespace is the answer. Turn your ideas into gorgeous, beautiful websites. And they have these amazing customizable templates and powerful e-commerce functionality. And that's a feature they added a couple of years ago, and it's super powerful. You can also buy domain names and choose from over 200 extensions, like I did for founder.university. So you're going to get great analytics. You're going to get search engine optimization. You're going to get free and secure hosting and 24-7 award-winning customer support and it's optimized for mobile. And here's my guy, Presh, my associate, and you see him browsing templates on Squarespace to create a site. He chooses a photography template and creates an active website within minutes. And here it is, superhumanwallpaper.com, a site to showcase superhumans inbox zero images. He just did that for fun, and you can see how quick and easy it is. Here's what I want you to do. Go to squarespace.com and get that free trial. They're so confident they give you the free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, your dreams, your vision, your company, your project, your event, use the offer code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Squarespace is amazing. Go in there and support squarespace.com and get that free trial going. It is an amazing product. I really love it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Alex McCaw is with us. He's a CEO and co-founder of Clearbit. Uh, he's 29 years old. Company just raised their $15 million Series A. Um, after doing their $2 million seed round in 2015. So you had a four years between the two rounds. We were cash flow positive. We were one yum, of your yum. Pegasus startups. I love it. Um, and, and that makes life really easy, doesn't it? It makes life a lot easier. Um, suddenly have less gray hairs. Yeah. You know, we, we were always... Um, very, very um, cash flow positive. You know, e even after the first year, we were profitable, mm -hmm. and uh, and then um, about January this year, we decided to raise a round because we found we were compromising on various things we wanted to do. Got but uh, we at least we made that decision. We weren't forced to. Right, and when you raise the two million dollar round, mostly from angels, you're probably diluting by thirty percent or something early on, right? Yeah, you're so taking big dilution, six, seven, eight million dollar valuation. Ex exactly. Yeah, it was a, bit, a little high, but yeah, it was big dilution. Um, and then the A was a, a two hundred fifty million dollar valuation. So. so you do a fifteen million dollar round mm -hmm. for two hundred fifty million, which means you diluted seven percent or something mm -hmm. for fifteen million. Mm -hmm. But originally, you diluted, let's say, twenty percent for the two million. Right. So you start thinking about that. You gave up 20% of the company for two, and then you only had to give up seven for 15. Think about how much more efficient that is. Yeah. And the only difference is you didn't get to have, whatever, another $5 million or $4 million to screw around in between those two. Mm -hmm. You just used the profits to grow. Yeah. And in retrospect, I wish I'd raised a bit less. Oh, even in the first round? Yeah. You're saying just raised a million. Yeah. Was there an internal discussion and pressure on you to raise another round? In other words, people in the team, like, why are we suffering through this, building our profits? Why don't we not, have people not throwing money Not internally, but I had a lot of investors pressuring me. To take more money? Oh, yeah. How did you 
this is people who wanted to invest in the company were like, hey, take my 10 million for 10%. Take my Both. 10 million for 20%. Existing investors and new investors. The existing investors were like, why are you not taking more money and growing faster? Yeah, I mean, I I understand where they're coming from. What? You know? Where is where they're coming from? How would you interpret that? The existing investors want you to take more money. Look, why? There, there is a... A positive and negative spin on this. A positive spin would be that this is what they've seen work, and they want signaling, and they want you to succeed. The slightly um, maybe negative spin on it is that they want their markups. Ah, so they don't get to feel good about themselves because the scoreboard still says the company's worth ten million, and they invested a two. Yeah, and. There, the negative spin might be that some investors want to mark it up in their portfolio, yeah. which is so dumb. It's so dumb. Because when I look at it, you know what I care about? Do, re, me. Show me the dough. Yeah. Let's talk do, re, me. If I had a company like com.com and, oh, my, my Alex, my other Alex. Alex is great. My yeah. Alex would send me an update. Yeah. Oh, my Alex. <laughs> my Alex, too. He would just send me this update. Jake Al. We did $140,000 this month. J-Cow, we did 450000 this month. Oh, my Alex. I will get that email from Alex. And <laughs> it's just like, I, I just I, I put my thumb right above it and I just go, oh, it's going to be so enjoyable to click this email from Alex. And then can... my thumb <laughs> slowly drops down and then, oh, yum, yum. Boom, I click it and it opens. Yeah. I can and see why you do this. You scroll <laughs> up just so slightly. Scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. October revenue, colon, oh, one million. Oh, you know I love do re, me. <laughs> and then I get that do re, me dopamine. Hit. Yeah. Oh. And I don't care if you raised money. <laughs> We're profitable. And you hit a seven figures in revenue. Mm -hmm. By all means, skip a couple of rounds of financing. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. Wait, you're a Brit? You're an English guy? I am. So do you know Alex from back in his- uh, I do. I how know. did the English look at Alex? Let's was... be honest. When he was doing the million dollar homepage and then he goes on to do Com, what was? Well, I knew Alex back in the day when Com just got started and um, no one had any idea it was going to be hmm. a business like that. Um, Nobody? Well, maybe he did. I certainly didn't. Anybody else you think no? I don't think so. Maybe you did. I don't know. Well, I put 378,000 large into the company <laughs> when it had 10,000 revenue. I knew. Yeah. Well, um, there were at least three of us who knew. Well, that's that's great. <laughs> <laughs> we knew. All right. When I left you, um, let's get back to the data privacy issue. Because I think sure. you, you have to deal with this on a regular basis. This is the number one issue uh, in Europe right now, mm -hmm. where you're from, is data privacy. Mm -hmm. If I'm a consumer... And I'm spooked by what happened with Facebook and all those profiles and data being, even though people put them in publicly, it, was, it feels a little weird to people when they see it aggregated, which it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Like if you're using the Facebook app and you know they're tracking your location, go to facebook.com and look at your locations and you will see, I just deleted my history from there because I didn't, I don't use Facebook, but I had the app on my phone mm -hmm. and it was tracking me 30 locations a day. You need everybody who hears my voice has to go in there and delete their location tracking. It's crazy. Right. What can I, how as a consumer, can I see what you have on me? Can I change it? How does that all work? So we, to be clear, as a consumer, we don't have your location. We just have your name and things like your Twitter handle. Um, right. Things that you have already opted into sharing. Right. And People know that, right? People know that if you give your email address to Twitter other people can find you by that email address. People do know that. I mean, people Google themselves. One, right. One assumes they realize this, this information is yeah. public. Yeah. So if you go to claim.clearbit.com, you can yeah. see all the information we have on you and you can right. remove it. What happened with GDPR? PR. And how did that impact your business, if at all? It was um, it was a tough uh, few weeks. We got a lot of calls from our customers. Um Honestly, at the end of the day, in retrospect, revenue-wise, I can't even point to it on a graph. So, Got it. So it had um, no impact on revenue. Yeah. What is, if we look at the history of GDPR and like the legacy of it, let's say, we're mm -hmm. looking at five years from now, how will we look back on what uh, the EU created? I believe it was the EU who sort of shepherded this. What What should we look at in terms of is the legacy of GDPR? Explain to people- how it came about and you know what impact it's had on the industry, if any. 
Have you heard the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? I have. I've lived it, in fact. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's GDPR. Got it. So their good intention was? Their good intention was to try and protect the privacy of, of their citizens. Okay. And the path to hell that we wound up on? They've managed to give Facebook and Google a monopoly. Even more of a monopoly. How so? Any regulation almost always benefits the existing incumbents. Mm -hmm. So in this case, how did it do that? Well, now it's quite uh, expensive to um, either uh, either abide by this regulation uh, so that it's much harder to start a company. But also, these advertising networks that didn't have an end relationship with the um, citizen of the, of the of the EU, got it. They couldn't get permission to um, use their data, right? Got Only it. Google and Facebook have that relationship because they have services. So right. the services like search mm -hmm. and sh photo sharing and whatever else they have, social networking, yeah, they are basically pulling up the ladder behind them. They right. have all this data because they use it to make the services better. Yeah. Whereas an ad network can't claim to make the service better. They can only claim to target ads better. People will click through anything that Google or Facebook give them. Right. They, 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 the service is that valuable to them. But the rest of the advertising companies don't have that relationship. So they, with one fell swoop, Europe destroyed the entire advertising industry. And do you have a lot of customers in Europe or is Europe like a slow growth, less important market for Clearbit? We have less, but we still have uh, a few. Less than 10% of your revenue, I would assume? I, I think so. So it's not even a focus. You as an entrepreneur who came and grew up yeah. in Europe, you look at Europe and think, eh, not really a great market. Yeah. Not a focus for us. I th I think we could concentrate on the US and have a great business for a long time. Interesting. Um, this in The way we're using Clearbit is to enhance the data in our database so mm -hmm. that we can target ads better. We're pretty upfront about that. Mm -hmm. We're also doing surveys with our data. So how do we? How should we look at enrichment data that you provide and then data that we have as signal? So we have a newsletter. We know that you subscribe to this newsletter. We know you opened it. We know you clicked a link. Mm -hmm. And we might ask you, what's your exact title? Right. Or uh, ask you how many people work in your company. But we also have your data mm -hmm. on that as well. How should we look at data that we get, let's just say firsthand data versus data you have, which is this aggregate data? What's interesting is that we have found marketing companies to trust our data more. Hmm. When someone's entering a title in uh -huh. a form, they will often not Ooh. be totally honest. People might elevate their title. Or they don't want to be contacted for whatever reason. Therefore, they pick... So they that they're the receptionist exactly. or they work in the mailroom as opposed to the CTO or CIO. Right. So we actually have a product that is uh, auto-completes forms. So mm. if you have a form um, and you have an email field, as soon as someone's finished typing the email, it'll ping us, figure out if we have data. If uh, we have data on that person, then the form is shortened. If we, ah. if we don't, then it's lengthened and we ask that person to fill in the missing blanks. It's nice to be profitable as a company mm -hmm. because you can sleep at night. The employees are not in this existential, low anxiety producing uh, situation where they're like, I've chosen to go to a startup, which means I've chosen to take a boat out into the middle of the ocean and it could get crazy when we run out of provisions. Mm -hmm. Did you see a, a change in culture in your startup versus your friend's startups because you were a Pegasus, because you were profitable? Did it make your job as the manager, as the CEO, easier because people can sleep at night? It definitely helped me sleep at night. Um, no more grinding your teeth? You ground your teeth in the first year? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I've done so much self-work these days. So, you know, I see a therapist. I've got an exec coach. All of that has really helped my mental health. Huh. Um, but... Yeah, profitability does does help, but I'm not particularly religious about it. So at this point in time, we're not profitable. You've chosen to not You've be profitable while you profitable. invest. Exactly. Uh, all right, when we get back from this quick break, you were anti-coaching, and then you embraced it with your CEO coach, Matt Mokery? Machari. Machari. I want to know 
how you got over your own personal bias and said, I need a coach. Mm -hmm. And then I want to tell you to tell everybody about that first meeting when you walk in with your coach and what happens and what you thought would happen and what was the difference between those two things, what you thought would happen with your coach and what actually happened when we get back on This Week in Star Wars. Are you struggling to sleep? Well, you're not alone. One in three U.S. adults does not get the sleep that they need. And not sleeping enough, that affects all your cognitive function. Think about it, like learning and problem solving and decision making, all these things we do as founders every day. Sleeplessness causes people to also be prone to more accidents, weight gain, and depression. But when we sleep, and we get that great night's sleep, you know what I'm talking about, then you're more focused and relaxed and you're actually happier. So that's why we're partnering with Calm, Calm Calm.com, the number one app for sleep. You're gonna get a library of programs from Calm that are designed to help you get the sleep your brain and body needs, like soundscapes and over 100 sleep stories. And I do these with my kids and they love it and I do it with myself and it is amazing. And here's my associate Presh, who has been having trouble sleeping because his boss is too intense. And he goes through it and he finds some nonfiction and he's looking, ooh, a cruise on the Nile, some Matthew McConaughey. What? Matthew McConaughey reading some sleep stories? He looks at the ASMR uh, painting, Beauty and the Beast. And then he looks at sleep. And he does lullaby to the stars. Ah, so relaxing. So here's your call to action. This week in startup listeners will get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash twist. That's right, calm.com slash twist. C-A-L-M dot com slash T-W-I-S-T. 40 million people have downloaded Calm, and it was Apple's 2017 app of the year. Find out why at calm.com slash twist. Thanks again to calm.com. Uh, I'm an investor in the company. I love the company, and I'm so proud of the work the team over there is doing. It's just such an amazing app and such a great story. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back to This weekend Startups, where I am doing my investor, what is it called, ASMR, EMSR, whatever that thing is, where you talk very quietly. And then I get the email from alex at com.com. And I put my finger over the email and I click it. And one day it said, in February, we were app of the year and we did $10 million in revenue. Wake up, Nick. Wake up, Nick. Wake up. Wake up. Oh my God, that is the greatest Pegasus. Look at that. My, I'm, I was so convincing with my, what is it called? ASMR? That's actually when you eat something that sounds like really interesting when you eat it. And like it, a peach or something. Yeah, and, and you film it. So you are anti-coach because mm-hmm. you're proud. It was you're a, a little bit proud. It was an ego thing. For it was sure. an ego thing. Yeah. Something must have happened to you. Yeah. Where you realized, geez, I'm. I may need some help here. Yeah. What was the moment? Did somebody quit on you? Did were you depressed? What was the moment you realized you needed some help? Well, the company was actually doing very well, which is why I didn't think I needed any help. Right. I was like, why do I need an exec coach? I'm clearly a good CEO because yeah. you know, look at the revenue of this company. Scoreboard. Right. And um, yeah, there's quite a lot of hubris in that idea. And luckily, I'd set and up, accuracy, and but, maybe some accuracy. Yeah. But luckily, I'd set up this. Uh, um, leadership team with some of the early people at Clearbit mm. uh, who've been at the company for almost five years now. Yeah. And we set up this feedback safe environment there. And so I was giving and receiving feedback. And that was when I got the feedback that I really needed to see a coach. Really? Yeah. So your team told you yeah. that you need to see a coach. Let me guess. You were too hard on your team. Were you too critical? I th- Did I, you hurt their feelings? <laughs> no, I think they, they tell me that because they love me. What was their reason? Let's be honest here. We're on the air. You've gotten through it. The company's very successful. Here you are on This Week in Startups, $250 million valuation. The world's your oyster. What was it that they told you? What was the leak in your game? I know it's hard to be honest, but Alex, go ahead. For the benefit of the other founders listening, what was it that you sucked at that they told you? Well, it came at a time- Or is it too painful? Where I had given up coding. Uh, and I'd, if you know many engineers, it's like just a part of their identity. Coding, yes. Coding. And so I had given this up and I had replaced it with nothing. And I was really depressed. I just, uh, I didn't know what to you do. You were a funk. Yeah. I so was you like, had nothing to do as the CEO. I was like- 
I don't know if I like managing. I don't know if I want to be a CEO. Ah. And you were at a crossroads. I was at a crossroads. With free time. Yeah. People don't realize this, though. It, when you're the CEO, there are moments where you have hired the right people, given them the right motivation and instructions and mission and values, and everything's just dialed in. And you find yourself all of a sudden with nothing to do. Did you have that moment where you're like, wait a second, it's all working and I'm not doing any of the work? I have that moment. And I think more CEOs should have it, honestly, mm. because I find that CEOs hero. And by what I, what I mean by that is that they give themselves busy work. They want to look busy. Mm -hmm. And they also think that sometimes they can do things a little bit better than other people. And they uh, haven't set up the right systems. They haven't hired the right people. And so they are constantly stressed. Mm. Yes, this is the hero complex that some founders have. And it typically comes from high performers, in my experience, like yourself with the coding, where they're just like, you know what? I put the whole team on my back and we won the game. Therefore, the way we win games is for you all to watch me put the ball in the basket. I am going to show you how it's done. Right. The truth is, what gets you to that level will not get you to the next. So you experience what got you here will not get you there. And what I think that clear deck moment is, the smooth sailing moment is, it's a recognition as the founder. And I think founders should really um, covet this moment in time. When you say, I, I walk up to the deck, you know, I was below deck sleeping, and I walk up onto the deck, and the boat is just sailing perfectly. Mm -hmm. Everything is in order. We're headed in the right direction, and I didn't have to lift a finger. It's amazing. It's called success. Yeah. It's called serious success when the thing operates so well that you don't need mm -hmm. to fret anymore. Mm -hmm. Then you can set a bigger challenge for yourself, right? Right. And you can also think about the future. You know, that mm. Part of your job is to think about the future and right. prepare for it. So you, can, you did that. You said, hey, I'm going to map out a bigger vision. Well, at that point- Or did you go back to coding because they were just like, this guy is really annoying when he's not working. <laughs> well, at that point in time, I didn't have the emotional maturity or the systems in place to think about the future. I was just depressed. So I got this coach, oh. Matt Mashari, yeah. and he showed me the love of company building. Ah. The love of management. Interesting. So you loved the moment when you were coding. That to you was just a peak experience, mm -hmm. it seems. Then you stop doing that, and now you're like, well, why am I here? Right. Why come to the office? Right. Did you have that day where you woke up and you're like, I don't feel like going to work? I just I just didn't know if I wanted to be a manager. I kind of didn't like management. I, I liked chatting to oh. computers rather than people. So you think you're going into this coach. Let's get back to that moment. Where is the first coaching session going to be held? At his office, at a coffee shop, walking over the Golden Gate Bridge? I got a lot of different perceptions in my mind. I've never had an explicit coach myself. So the, fir the first thing is you got to find this coach. So I started asking around. Huh. And I asked um, Naval Ravikant. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was like, you know what? I have the perfect person. I think he's the best coach in the world. This guy really? called Matt Mashari. And he Matt written, Mashari. And he written this book. Uh, it was on Google Docs uh, about how to run a company. It's called The Great CEO Within. And I read this book, and I thought it was incredible. I wish I'd read it years before. And so then I was like, I have to meet the person. Mm. So he came around to our office. Um, and what's in, yeah, he basically, he was about to start a gig at Coinbase. But he had some time in between. And so he was like, I'll coach you, Alex, um, for free. And in between now and when I started Coinbase. Huh. And... Uh, and then he sat down with me every day for a couple of weeks and in all my one-on-ones and pr practically every meeting. And he showed me what, what he calls the Mashari method. Hmm. Um, and it, if you read the book, it's, it details it all. What, what would you, if you were to summarize this Mashari method, um, what did you learn about management and company building? Mm -hmm. And... How did you fall in love with your startup all over again? Well, there's a few different aspects to uh, the Mashari method. And 
I can't do it justice in of this short time, yeah. but I would what say your, ta- your the, takeaways. The, the what key, are the things that hit you? The key tenants, yeah. um, and the ones that I w- were particularly bad at. The first one is feedback. Mm, feedback. Feedback. I was not open to feedback. I felt like from who? Feedback from who? F- from my team, like you said earlier. Yeah. I felt, you know, I like I was the bee's knees. I'd yeah. fucking made look, this company. Look. Yeah. Look at the scoreboard. Why, why do I need feedback? Um, it's my, that's my position. Right. <laughs> look at the scoreboard. So that that was the uh, that was the that was the first thing is yeah. is feedback is the key to personal growth. Oh. And oh. instituting a feedback system um, in every one on one at Clibit, you have feedback. So you Got give it. and receive feedback. Got it. And um, so and you were not open to feedback previously. You didn't encourage it. No, I did not. And if people gave you feedback unsolicited, how did you handle it previously in the sort of Alex 1.0? Well, I went what I call below the line. So when you're below the line, you are not curious. You're defensive. Mm. You want to be right. Right. Um, so that's the that's the space that I would go into when I receive feedback. Like a reptilian, just reactive mode. Exactly. Like yeah. fight or flight response. Yeah. And now you've learned to do what? So now I've learned to view feedback as a gift. Mm. So I, Namaste. I call it as a, above the line. So mm. I try and be curious. I try and be open-minded. I try and seek the truth rather than my personal right. Got it. And uh, and it's really transformed me. And I can tell you, it's not always easy. Some of the feedback I get is is brutal. You know, really? I do they tell you you're aloof or tell you you're a jerk? What do they tell you? I uh, I had some feedback about a year ago from my COO, and he told me, Alex, you suck at public speaking. And every Monday morning at the All Hands, you drone on and on and on, and it's hurting. You is having this, this company. Still works for you? It's not gonna. It's not gonna scale. So after you fired him, <laughs> got him out of the building for giving that. No, you. That was good feedback, I guess. If you can't speak well publicly, because look how good you are here on the podcast. You're authentic it's, and well, well articulate. That's because I got a speech coach. You did. Yeah. Ah. So that's you were curious about it. It was good. It was a good note. It was fantastic. It yeah. hurt. You know why? It did really it hurt? hurt. Why did it hurt? You know why it really hurt. Cause the I drone kn- on and on thing? Well, because I knew it was true. Uh, yeah, I secretly knew it was true. You knew you weren't a great speaker. I knew I wasn't a good speaker. And then how did you get better? The speech coach comes in and uh, they just teach you how to not panic when you're on stage? or. Uh, so he has a whole stage in Mills Valley. He has a theater. So you go there and he'll show you two aspects. He'll show you the, the physical aspect around enunciation mm. and uh, sentence formation. And then he'll also go into the content of the wow. speech as well. Because you, you you can't leave that aspect of it out. You've When you write a speech, you always have to think to yourself, what is the emotion that I want people to come away from this with? Mm. You know, because they're probably not going to remember everything, but they will remember the feeling. Got it. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> it's basically what people... F- happens after a TED talk is that people feel something. Yeah. As opposed to like they got some specific tactical piece of information. Yeah. There was a feeling. Right. And there might be some tactics, but the feeling's the most important aspect. It's interesting. Yeah. Um you provide coaching now to all of your senior team members or therapy. And what's the difference between therapy and coaching in your mind? So they are very different things. Okay. And it, you should have t- two different people for them, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Um, so yes, everyone, actually everyone at Clibit has a therapist. Uh, we use a service called Modern Health to provide that. One Health. Modern Health. Oh, Modern Health. Yeah. So this is like a therapist over SMS or over video N- chat? No, um, the, the, they have, I think, monthly in-person sessions that ah. any, anyone can go to. Um, so that costs you a couple hundred bucks? I, uh, it's I can't remember, I don't know how much it costs the company, but it's, it's probably not cheap. <laughs> it's a couple hundred bucks, I think. What does a coach a, a cost? A session, yeah. Three hundred, four hundred bucks for a coach. Yeah, times we're about the clip is about hundred people at this point, so times by that. Um, so everybody in the company can do this. Everyone in the company can do this. Wow. Yeah. So this is a big expense for you. Yeah. And you decided to provide therapy to everybody for free, anonymously. Obviously, mm-hmm. they can do it or not. You don't know if they do it. 
I don't know. I have, I have nothing to do with it. Got um, it. They just sign up. Right. And for you, this was important. Why? I think it's part of being a good human, you know, growing yeah. emotionally. I, you Why know, is it good for the business and your shareholders? Well, you know, I always used Because to, the shareholders are paying for this, so well, you have I, to be able to make that decision too, right? Yeah. So I have always felt, well, previously I felt like therapy was something that sick people do. Right. right, stiff upper lip. Right? right, you're English. I'm British. British. So stiff upper lip. Exactly. So if you're not happy, you see a therapist. If you're happy, you don't see a therapist. Yeah, stay calm and carry on. Right. And then I now I realize that's just ridiculous. Uh, if if you want to grow and learn why you feel the things you feel, mm. then you see a therapist. Got it. Got it. What is it like growing up British and? the view of mental health and stuff like that. Is that true? The stiff upper lip? And it, it's totally stay calm? true. Yeah. I don't think um, my father likes therapy that much. Um, no. No. <laughs> no. Our dads do not like therapy. No. <laughs> no that's not for me. <laughs> but, you know, each, each their own. Um, it's... Remember, they fought the great wars and saved civilization. Yeah. They didn't have time to talk about their feelings. I think my father was about five during the war, but yes, I get your point. <laughs> they did, though. They, I think a lot of it was we don't have time to indulge ourselves mm -hmm. and our feelings if we're going to fight the Nazis and we're going to fight the communists, if we're going to hold the line here and save Europe. I, now, that's paradoxical because they do need it because PTSD is a real thing and you probably need it even more. But there is a charmingness to, I think, the British stiff upper lip and, you know, stay calm and carry on and, and be a good soldier. I Look, I agree with you. It's a superpower. Totally, that we are now at the Maslow's hierarchy. We are top of the pyramid of the Maslow's yeah. hierarchy of needs. Hmm. And and this is something that is amazing that is that we have at our disposal and we should take it because it's at our disposal, but it's kind of a luxury. Uh, all right, you got a new product. It's called Clearbit X. Mm -hmm. When we get back, uh, um, I want to see how it works. And you, you're doing a little superhuman velvet rub strategy here. You have to wait in line. Yeah. Do a little onboarding. Yeah. Uh, very good. Learn from that from Rahul. Oh, he's he's the greatest. Um, is he an investor or a friend or Both. just? Oh, very good. Uh, when we get back, uh, I want to hear what you've learned from him. And then what is the new product, Clearbit X, when we get back on this week in startups? Founders use a million tools to be more efficient, and one of those tools you need is to get sleep. If you have great sleep, you're gonna be a great leader, you're gonna make great decisions. If you don't have great sleep, well, you know this, because the nights you've gotten bad sleep, you're cranky the next day, you're unfocused, and you're gonna make poor decisions. The ultimate hack for all founders is to get a great night's sleep. How do you get a great night's sleep? You're asking, how do I do it? I have eight sleep. I have this amazing bed that allows me to set the temperature. Thermo regulation is critical. And I'm married. One half of the bed is for my wife, one half is for me. And then there's a line down the middle that you don't see where she can set hers. And literally she's got it on like plus seven, plus eight. I mean, it's warm, it's toasty. And mine, I'm negative three. I like it nice and cool. And then in the morning, it slowly cools us down so our heart rate goes up and you wake up naturally. I love this product. I love it so much uh, that I have been actually invested in the company. They were an advertiser on the podcast. I got one. I fell in love with it. I told all my friends about it. Two or three of my friends have it now. We all get better sleep and it gives you a sleep score the next day so you can see how you're sleeping. Supercharge your health and productivity like I am. Get the sleep you need and deserve by heading to 8sleep.com slash twist. E-I-G-H-T. S L E E P dot com. It's two words, eight sleep dot com slash twist. And you can try it risk free for 100 days. And I literally encourage you to just try it, get that eight sleep. And if you don't like it, return it on the 99th day. They'll just take it back. They are so confident that you will not return this thing. And I tell you, it's the best bet I've ever had. Eight sleep dot com slash twist. Just go try it. And trust me, everybody loves this thing. It's incredible. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right. Great guest. Alex McCaw is with us. He is the CEO and co-founder of Clearbit. He's only 29, started this company when you're 24. Yeah. You were an engineer at Twitter from 2011 to 2012, mm -hmm. uh, which is the years of uh, getting out of Falwell territory mm -hmm. and scaling. Mm -hmm. That must have been a complete disaster to work at Twitter during that time period. It was interesting. And then I moved to Stripe. During... The boom years, 2012 and 2013, but you do these two one-year stints. Are you not employable? I'm not, no. 
You're just not employable. I'm you not did employable. two one-year stints. You did your best. Yeah. No, I suck at working for other people. And you just thought you were smarter than your manager, didn't you? Th- Be honest. <laughs> your managers aren't listening from Twitter and Stripe. They're punching a clock. They have no ambition. No. But your mid-level managers at those two companies, it was you more- were smarter than them, weren't you? It was more, I wanted a sense of control. Mm. I wanted to control my own destiny. But if you were to say who was smarter, you or your direct manager in both those companies. Well, my direct manager at Stripe was Patrick Collison, and I'm not smarter than You're definitely not smarter than that direct manager. I can tell you that. I got a long way to go, kid. You're definitely not smarter than Patrick. Who was your, uh, but you, at Twitter, that was a bit of a disaster at that time period. So you work two one-year stints, Mm -hmm. and you get out of Dodge. You realize you got to run your own show. Yeah, I mean, I it's built into me to run startups. I've run I ran startups in England, mm. and little lifestyle businesses. What was your lifestyle business? What was, what was the one that you had the most hopes for, but was the biggest disaster? And which one actually got traction? <laughs> That's a funny story. Um, I had one um, that would moderate social uh, social media or just content. So you would send it images, and it would tell you if there was a dick in it or not. Ah, got it. And. Um, a penis. Yes. Uh, yes. It's called social mod. And social mod. Yeah. This is a great idea. Yeah. Um, so the idea was before social networks actually were moderating, because yeah. they weren't moderating in the beginning. Right. They were, it's very light hand, and there were only a million or two million people using these, so it didn't matter. Not even social networks, but also anyone who wanted to have any user-generated content. And then you would just charge them per object and then send mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Now, the problem was I was, you know... 17, 18, I'm 18, and so I knew nothing about running businesses. Right. And also, I was a terrible programmer, so there was a ton of bugs in this thing. And, right. And and penises got on websites. And, and uh, the hot dogs got taken off. Yeah. So. You were like, you're just not that good at <laughs> yeah. identifying a penis. It was- uh, You that... can confirm that Alex McCaw is not good at identifying <laughs> a penis. Okay, fair enough. Your you coding have... skills you had did not first. save you. <laughs> <laughs> so what- what was the other business that actually worked? Um, I had one called Sourcing.io. Um, Sourcing.io. Okay. They would let you find software engineers, essentially a search engine for software engineers. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. It made lots of money. It did make money? Yeah. How did you make money? Just placing people? Uh, or just charging 50 bucks a month? Just charging it? 50 bucks a month to, um, huh. to, you know, to HR agencies or departments. And, uh, and so I ran that for a bit, but I got bored. You want to know my best business when I was a kid? Oh, yeah? Jason's Hot Tapes. <laughs> you don't know about Jason's Hot Tapes? I, no. <laughs> All right. So I had a typewriter, and I typed my own business card. It said Jason's Hot Tapes. I laminated it. I'd hand people the business card, and then I'd ask them for the card back because I only had one. I would just hand it to him. This is who I am, and then i take the card back because it was a laminated card that just said Jason's Hot Tapes and my home phone number. My dad, a guy owed him like three or four grand. He lost playing poker. Or backgammon. Can't remember. The guy was connected. And they at this movie theater in Bensonhurst would set up when Betamax tapes came out, VHS tapes came out, they would set up five or six cameras. And during the day, they would run The Empire Strikes Back and they would make a cam. They would record the screen on an open air microphone. So the guy says to my dad, "I, I know I owe you the three grand. I'll get it to you but I wanted to give you this as a payment. I know your kid loves the Star Wars movies. The Empire Strikes just came out. He's seen it like five times. Here, you can watch it at home every day. Here's a copy of The Empire Strikes Back. So my dad had one of the first VCRs in 1983 or four. I got a friend who had a one. I got my friend to bring him over. I connected the two of them, and I started making copies of a really bad version of The Empire Strikes Back and selling it at school for 20 bucks. I sell about 30 or 40 of these for cash. Then I get called to my math teacher's office. Uh, and he was like, uh, I hear that you're selling something at school. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, listen, I, I know you're selling copies of The Empire Strikes Back. And I said to him, uh, okay. And he says, how much are they? <laughs> and I said, I just looked at him and I was like, well, I've been selling these for 20. But this, that's the kids. So I said, 40. He goes, how about 30? And I said, sure. And I took a copy of that my strikes back. I had to do my bad teacher. I took 30 bucks off him. That's my first business. That's great. <laughs> Jason's hot tape. <laughs> <laughs> 
I apologies to George Lucas. I owe you about nine hundred dollars with interest. I think it's more. Th- He'll yeah. be fine. I think it'll be okay. He, he's got Billy. And I almost interviewed George Lucas, and I was going to bring this up with him in my interview. <laughs> he might have punched me in the face. Um, so what's clear about X? So we like calling it God mode for marketers. God mode for marketers. So essentially, you can put one script on your website and see who's visiting your website. You can ah. de- de-anonymize who's visiting your website. And then you can do stuff with that information. You can put people in specific ad audiences. Ah. You can uh, Explain what an th- ad audience is. So I know these people came from a big company or a small company or a mm-hmm. medium company or Microsoft or Google, whatever, GE. What does a specific audience mean well, for people you, who don't know about advertising? specific advertising to enterprise uh, visitors or you have specific advertising to health care visitors. Got it. Then you can um, put them in those groups and those buckets and they'll, they'll see those ads. So, retargeting, though it's almost like retargeting people who visited your website, yeah. but doing it in intelligent buckets. Mm-hmm. So, somebody comes to This Week in Startups, and we know they're from an advertiser or something. We can then give them ads about advertising on This Week in Startups, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. We got to do that. That'd be a great idea. Awesome. I'll yeah. send you an invite code. Or, if people came to angelthebook.com and they saw my book- we could then say, if they're a high net worth individual, would you know that or no? No, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Because no. then I could say, hey, join the syndicate.com where we you can angel invest with me. You could just see if they were from a metropolitan area like SF or New York. Ah, and then put them into the metropolitan area. Yeah, just like slightly higher. Uh, huh. Um, and so this is different than the clear bit basic service that you have already yeah, had Yeah, so out. this is a, essentially a natural evolution of what we've been doing before, except we, we don't have... APIs and code anymore. It's now a nice UI. Ah, so you used to be able to do this, but you had to write a bunch of code. Yeah. Then I'm guessing one of your customers wrote this code, showed it to you. That's exactly right. And you listen to your customers yeah. because you learn from your therapy yeah. <laughs> that you're so terrible at talking <laughs> and you're such a horrible human being that you needed to be more curious and yeah. be above the line. Yeah. So you listen to one of your customers and then built productized their hack. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, com- company called Zendesk. Oh, Zendesk had used your software to do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I passed on investing in that. I'm an idiot. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so dumb. I'm so dumb. It's that, I mean, literally, I told Zendesk, help desks software is very sophisticated. And I worked in IT. And this software is just too simple. And he said, no, that's the idea. Like, this is 14 years ago, 12 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. And he's like, yeah, that's the idea. We're going to make it so simple that more people will have help desks because most people don't take the time to build a help desk. They just answer the phone because right. it's too complicated to put help desk software. I was like, well, I was in IT. We, you really need to have like codes and billing and this and that. And they were like, yeah, no, no. We just, people type in their problem and we direct them to the FAQ and then it rolls back. And I was like, you know what? This is way too simple. It's not going to work. Nobody wants this like... And that literally making things too simple is the, what the entire last 10 years has been about yeah. on the internet and software. Well, you can't get them all, Jason. <laughs> I know. See, this is why I need to go to a therapist <laughs> because I do feel I can get them all. I would talk to and therapists I want to get them all. about why you want to get them all. <laughs> why do I, isn't it obvious? <laughs> go Ray me. I want to just get in on the next big. No, it's really about bragging rights. That's right. It is about, that's the best part. Oh, my Uh God. When you don't pass on and other people have, do you know how glorious that is? Oh, it's so glorious. (laughs) Uh, What have you learned? You've been doing this for five years. If you were advising your younger self, go back in time, what would you tell a young Alex McCaw starting his journey to do better? Get it. Get an exec coach and a therapist. That's that's, that's number low one. Low hanging fruit. Yeah, low hanging fruit. Be vulnerable. Um, try and why lead, is that important? Being vulnerable. Try and lead with vulnerability because it builds trust. Mm-hmm. And putting on a brave face all the time is just stressful. It's it's just um, it's huh. it, it causes burnout. And this is why the people, the British people with that stiff upper lip and trying to keep that front up, it actually isn't good. They should be more vulnerable. No one believes it anyway. Your, your employees have great radar as to whether the business is going well or not. You yeah. might as well be honest with them. Yeah, because they've chosen to be there on that journey with you. And we're 
reacting with our reptilian mind to the fear of like these businesses going out of business as if it would be our lives ending and the tribe being overrun and killed right. by a bunch of mountain lions or something. Yeah. Which is the exact opposite of the case. Like we live right. in a privileged time when like we're living to 70, 80, 90 years old and Right. I and mean, to your point, fear. That's another thing that rules a lot of people's lives. It's so crazy. It's just people making decisions out of fear all the time. Bad decisions. Bad decisions. People make bad decisions out of fear. Yeah. Because our we have now evolved in the last hundred years as a society well past most of the fears that we were supposed to have a hundred years ago. Well, if you think about why do you feel that knot in your stomach when someone is giving you feedback, right? Yeah. Well, a hundred years ago, someone was pissed with you. They could have killed you, you know, a few hundred years ago. Yeah. The the amount of violent interaction between yeah. humans a hundred years ago yeah. was a magnitude more than it is now. Right. And just think about this. I, did, you, did you have fights at school when you were a kid? You're 29? A little. Not too many. Not too many. And then you look at my generation, and we were in fights constantly. Yeah. And then I look at my dad's generation, and, and they were just an all and out like gangs in New York brawls. Well, they were fighting a couple of world wars probably, or your, your dad's dad. Dad's dad, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it, it's the chances of dying a violent death has never been lower as right. a human being but our, than today. Right, but our brains don't. Brains that. do not perceive that. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, all right. What's going on with your, uh, a lot of these B2B companies here uh, starting to tap into Facebook advertising and Facebook is getting wildly expensive. Instagram, wildly expensive. Is that still a good channel? I think uh, this will be one of the biggest shifts over the next 10 years because there are a lot of businesses out there that rely on low CACs, low cost of acquisition on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Practically every gaming company, for a start. Yeah. And they haven't had to compete against B2B SaaS companies because B2B SaaS companies haven't been using Facebook. Mm. These days, B2B companies, SaaS companies are starting to realize that Facebook is actually a good channel. Ah. And they're starting to utilize it. And now they can outbid all of these game companies, no problem. Because their average customer spends twenty, fifty, a hundred thousand a year. Exactly, their margins are so much bigger, and they're all competing for the same screen real estate. Mm. So, you would fall into that SaaS group that's able to. Your average customer spends, I'm sure, five figures with you, six figures. Yeah, I mean, we we even built a tool, Clibit X, to help you uh, do advertising on Facebook. Got it. Which is hard because people use their personal email addresses. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so you don't know their company affiliation, right? Um, but we've we do the mapping behind the scenes at Clearbit, mm. so you can actually yeah, um, map to those people, and you can do B two B targeting that Facebook natively doesn't let you do. I gotta have you come to my accelerator and give a talk about how to do all the stuff with Clearbit no. X. All right, everybody, go ahead and try Clearbit X if you're looking for a job and you want to work for somebody who's super enlightened. Namaste, who is willing to take that constructive feedback. The wokest CEO. The wokest of the CEOs. You are <laughs> namaste enlightened. Yeah. You are enlightened. And you're friends with Naval. That's right. Ravikant. Even by proxy, I am. The en- most enlightened. enlightened. Yeah. His tweets are the greatest. <laughs> yeah. Namaste. Yeah. I, every time I read his tweets, I'm just like, oh, I, I understand like 60% of them. And even those, are, it takes me like a, a minute or two to just digest them. He really goes for less is more. Mm-hmm. I like his podcasting ability too. Now Naval's doing two minute podcasts. I do 60 minutes. Oh, he's fantastic. Great podcast. He's doing this uh, spear, spearhead? Yeah. Yeah. It's, bad. it's pretty smart. You going to yeah. be an angel investor at some point? You yeah. thinking about it? I do a bit of angel investment, but I don't like to talk about it publicly. <laughs> Just put a little 50K check here and there, like put a little 100K check in uh, your friends' companies? Yes, I do. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Oh, are you a scout for somebody? Uh, oh, that's a yes. <laughs> You don't even have to tell me. I just, you look down at your shoes. You turn a little red. I saw the gulp. You don't have to tell me. You're a scout. I got it. Who are you a scout for? Go ahead. Give it up. I'm part of Spearhead. He's part of Spearhead. Yeah. Ah. Now explain what Spearhead is. So Spearhead is a system where they give you a million dollars to invest in other companies. Is that public knowledge that you're a member of Spearhead or have you been keeping that on the DL? I like keeping it on the DL because I have such good deal flow that I don't want to add any noise to it. Right. This is a smart idea. Back in the day, before I was like internet famous, 
the only companies I met were like friends of friends. So the signal was very high. Now with the podcast being so popular and the events being popular, I have to sort through a large degree of stuff that is right. maybe not as high quality, which I don't mind because I, I want to hit all of them. Mm -hmm. All right, listen, continued success. Uh, great job. And uh, we need to get this. Uh, wait, wait, what did Matt Mokery? Mashari. Mashari. He went on to do Coinbase? Uh, no, 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 so he he's still a coach. coaches the founders of Coinbase, Reddit, Y Combinator, Brex, Whoa. like all of them. You should get him on the podcast. I was about to say, we should have this guy on the podcast because we've had Jerry Colonna, the Michael Jordan of CEO coaches on the podcast so many times. Maybe uh, we, get, we get Matt on and talk to him. I'll See if he can you. make me cry. <laughs> See if I can. Did you cry with he'll, your coach? He'll how many times did you? How many sessions with your coach in did you cry? I did cry. <laughs> was it the second meeting or the third? It was the first. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first meeting. You're like, yeah. I'm a mess. <laughs> I built a company that everybody wants to invest in. Oh, uh, how do you oh, how do you know I'm that? Making millions of dollars. <laughs> my mom. It is extremely dad. difficult. What was it that? What was the moment that made you cry? You just felt like existential release that somebody was listening to you or no we were talking about something very very personal so uh, i i mishari is a coach for all sorts of things he, uh, ah you talk about something personal yeah. i got you was it your feelings of inadequacy as a child it was Parlay. mostly around that you know it was actually it goes back to the time that i didn't invest in zendesk and <laughs> I had the same thing that I talked to my therapist about. When I missed the Zendesk investment, I cried. And I didn't cry when I missed the investment. When I heard the last valuation, that's when I cried. Yeah. I cried. And then I opened up that email from Alex from Calm, and I scrolled through, I clicked it, and I saw, oh, unicorn status. Oh, so yummy. All right, listen. Great guest. Good job. You brought it today. It's going to go down in history as a great episode. Uh, come back on the pod uh, in another year or two. And uh, let's check in with you again. Alex McCaw is the CEO and co-founder of Clearbit. Uh, go check out Clearbit if you're looking to work at a company with a super enlightened founder. Well, don't come work for me. Go work for Alex. And uh, we'll see you all next time on this week's Starters. Bye-bye.